Good day chaps. So today's vehicle will be the mighty Matilda. We're going to look at its background, its design and development, but also some of its performance issues and the problems it faced in testing, which resulted in an unnecessary overhaul that saw limited numbers ready when they were needed the most. So our story of Matilda begins in the 1930s. The British had ruled the Rus for a short time following the end of the First World War, in terms of tank design and use, and many interesting and innovative machines have been designed, including the formation of sites and organisations to support their development. However, by the early 1930s, this had slowed down somewhat, and other nations were also catching up. One of the key players in this new game was the French, who, along with the Soviet Union, featured the largest pre-war tank fleets in the world, However, unlike the UK, which had relied more on the small light tankettes and a core fleet of ageing medium tanks, the French focused more on protection, with characteristically heavy armour and firepower over the cost of mobility. These were split into approximately two categories, the well-armoured but slow tanks designed to support infantry and faster cavalry tanks, although there were subclasses in each branch. The British, meanwhile, were keeping close tabs on the French, and were well aware of this new development, and noted that it was gathering interest abroad as well. Thus, an order was placed for the construction of similar vehicles in 1934, with armour of no less than 25mm, and to be armed with either a light or heavy machine gun for the role of assaulting gun emplacements and fixed defences. The infantry tank, as it was to be named by Sir Percy Hobart, would have the ability to cross wire, deal with guns, but be immune to return anti-tank fire. Meanwhile, a second vehicle would be designed to deal with the armour and have similar characteristics to the first, but be armed with a more powerful gun for dealing with tanks and a three-man turret. These vehicles were given the code names Infantry Tank Mark I and split into two categories, the A11 Matilda I and the A12 Matilda II, the Suffolk numbers being used to separate the machines. The name Matilda itself has caused some issues over the years. Some attribute it to Sir Hugh Ells, others to John Carden. The name was certainly recorded as code name Matilda on the original sketches, and the name was applicable to both versions of the vehicle, which is why we have the same name for both vehicles, Matilda 1 and Matilda 2, as both have the same origin. Quite why the name was chosen is more of a mystery. The idea was that it was named after a toy duck, and that's not without flaw. Such toys were in fashion at the time, and so the idea is not without merit. Or possibly it was named after Queen Matilda, as we had a habit of naming several vehicles after various monarchs, with examples such as Edward and Oswald. And both Percy Hobart and DSD Carr, who came up with this naming convention, were involved in these vehicles and the later Matilda, However, this is still only food for thought until further concrete evidence emerges. It's also often said that Matilda II was a sequel to the first vehicle, the A11, which isn't true. Rather, it was a second vehicle built as a parallel program with an anti-tank gun. The weapon was to be the new 40mm two-pounder gun, which at the time was arguably the best anti-tank gun in the world and was able to perforate most vehicles in existence even at long range and was considered a distinct improvement over the older but larger 47mm 3-pounder gun in use of vehicles like the Medium Mark II. It was, however, this realisation, along with the French, that gave rise to the first problems, in that you had designed a gun that was more than capable of penetrating the thickest armour your next tank would have. This fact, along with other developments abroad, led to the armour for both vehicles being increased, initially to 40mm and finally 60mm or more. The first vehicle would go to Vickers and be worked on by John Carden. Meanwhile, the second set was passed to the Woolwich Arsenal. It's believed the reason for this split came about in 1935. Sir John Carden was killed at the age of 43 in a plane crash, leaving Vickers without their head engineer, and the role was filled in by one of Carden and Lloyd's lead engineers, Leslie Little, who took over the project, but he was opposed to some of the requirements listed in the second machine believing it would be more practical to have a two-man turret and a lighter suspension. He would go on to privately design his own vehicle, named the Valentine. As a result of this, the second design would go to the Woolwich Arsenal, under DSD Carr, who had a sound knowledge of building large tanks, 
and already produced the A6 and A7 series, both of which had been undergoing trials with different suspension systems and weapons configurations. Thus began the development of the infantry tank A12 Matilda. One of the key tanks that was used in the Matilda's development was that of the A7E3, which we've covered in a previous video. This machine, however, is not, as written sometimes, a prototype Matilda, and was in its own a separate design to replace the obsolete Medium Mark II and the failed Medium Mark III tanks. However, that being said, several of the ideas tested on the A7E3 did carry over into the Matilda, notably the dual AEC engines, the covered suspension, and the Wilson gearbox system, as well as the 40mm gun with shoulder controls, while information on radios and the crew arrangements were also providing valuable data. However, Woolwich Arsenal would not be responsible for building the machine. That tender went to the Vulcan foundry in Lancashire, who, like many of the tank building sites, both in the UK and elsewhere, traditionally made trains. As much as the equipment and skills required to make tanks is transferable from train building. Vulcan's own engineers were involved with the design itself, not so much in their combat capabilities, but ensuring that the design itself could be built and that the features it would use were within their capabilities, which included the ability to cast large parts of the hull and turret, a first of British tanks, which were often designed around the preferred riveted build. The War Office gave Vulcan the contract for building two prototypes, which was standard of the day, paying them £15,000 apiece, with a deal signed in 1937. The first working prototype was ready on the 11th of April 1938, given the number A12E1, and sent down to the Mechanical Warfare Experimentalist Establishment, or MWE, for mobility trials, where she was able to travel a distance of 1,000 miles, and problems or breakdowns were evaluated and adjustments were made. One of these problems was found to be an attraction, which we'll cover later, but it caused major problems to this tank. This prototype is easily identifiable from a distance due to having six mud chutes instead of the later five seen in the production machines, as well as the distinct high exhausts for fording operations. A12E1 was then sent to Lowell for gunnery trials and to be found to be quite an excellent vehicle in this regard. Her slow speed of 9 miles per hour across country was deemed perfectly adequate for an infantry tank. After all, it had to operate alongside the foot sloggers, and so speed wasn't that important. With her lower speed, she was also considered extremely accurate, being even able to fire on the move, while well, slowly, and still hit a target, which while we take for granted today, was quite novel back then. The two-pounder gun was also considered an excellent weapon, However, one of the ongoing myths online is that the two-pounder never had a high explosive round made for it, which would render the tank less effective versus anti-tank guns, and so on. This is also a myth. Over 11,000 two-pounder rounds with high explosives were made. However, they were not issued. Now, whether this was an oversight, a clerical error, or just negligence remains to be discussed, but the rounds certainly were made and tested. A contract for full production was then issued with Vulcan to be the primary producer. However, that Muppet Hitler was gaining ground in Europe, and war was now inevitable. Meanwhile back home, the UK was not up to strength with equipment, and so began the appeasement and phony war predating World War II. While this subject is hotly debated, it was clear to some that no matter what occurred diplomatically in the short term, war was still inevitable one way or the other. And so while overtures of peace were in progress, the mass rearmament was taking place, with heavy industry being shifted to a war footing and resources being stored for an upcoming conflict. This saw new contracts and Matildas being placed. In August 1938, an order for 40 was placed with Ruston and Hornsby, and another 40 with John Fowler and Co in Leeds, who made trains and steam engines, and had already made adaptions to the A11, such as the mine plough. This was followed quickly by LMS in Horwich for 120 tanks, while the North British Locomotive Company, who had built tanks during the First World War, once again found its trains been sidelined for tank production. And finally, Harland and Wolfe in Belfast was given an order for 130 tanks. The Matildas began entering mass production as quickly as possible. Matilda, however, did have one major problem. It was unable to travel over wet grass, even up slopes of a modern gradient and this would cause some huge problems. 
The information regarding the faulty Matilda suspension comes directly from Brigadier William Blagden, who was the Assistant Director of Mechanisation of the British Expeditionary Force at Emwe in the years preceding World War II. Blagden, who was considered by some to be a bit of a rebel as officers went, was a key player in early tank design, having the handy ability to be able to differentiate between what would work and what was just wishful thinking, and also had a keen ability to translate what was being said in the field to what was actually needed in the tank design, a rather rare trait in officers of the time. He was involved in the design of the Dingo armoured car, as well as various aspects of Matilda's testing, and they coined the term Mobiquity, the definition of a vehicle's ability to move off-road compared to on-road use. Blagden also felt that there was a defining problem at the mechanisation sites, and this was down to a mix of who was employed. On one hand, you had soldiers and service personnel, with only rudimentary engineering knowledge and a familiarity with tractor vehicles. And then you had the engineers and draftsmen, who were primarily civilian contractors who knew wheeled vehicles, but were unfamiliar in many cases with tract equipment. Thus you had a situation in which neither side clearly knew the other side's work very well, but would not communicate any issues clearly, which led to several major oversights. In 1935 the Mechanisation Board was formed, which was split into two distinct branches, A and B. The former would specialise in tracks and the latter in wheeled vehicles, and the MWE became the ME or Mechanisation Experimental Establishment, with the A and B sections each under a Master of General Ordnance. However, despite this, there were still outside influences and a lack of communication, which in his words led to a muddled responsibility and appalling amateurism in some areas. In his 1940 report, he wrote on the two Matildas. The first, he said, was problematic in that it only had a two-man crew and initially lacked a wireless set, and what was needed was a three-man turret with a radio. Vickers, who at this point was still a bit sulky, presented their new tank in February of 1938. However, the war office was not that interested, as they wanted a three-man turret as requested, and so it was not accepted, with Leslie Little arguing that the recommendations from the war office would just add unneeded weight. Thus, the Valentine was rejected, hence she was never given an A-series prefix, However, Blagden did note that unlike the Matilda, Valentine's automotive features were better in his eyes, primarily due to the lower weight than that of Matilda. He also favoured the Czech machine gun Leslie Little had used, which went on to become the Beezer machine gun. By the time war was declared, the UK had six regiments of light tanks in France and one regiment of infantry tanks. However, there was a lack of Matilda II tanks, and this the Brigadier recorded was down to the deplorable stupidity which delayed the arrival of arguably Britain's best tank at the outset of the war. This had stemmed from the spring trials of 1940 that saw the Matildas equipped with the older, flat-style tracks which were unable to operate on wet grass on even a gentle slope. Two independent teams assessed the situation. The first team believed it was down to the low suspension and side skirts and recommended that the suspension on all Matildas be lifted. The second team, correctly, identified the issue as a lack of decent grip on the treads and welded on spuds, which resolved the problem immediately. However, nobody got their memo, as once again the department heads were not listening to each other, and every Matilda was delayed from going to France for a long period of time while they raised all the suspension by six inches. These Matildas are identifiable at a glance if you can see the bogies complete and not half covered. The raising of the suspension actually made the tanks worse and very prone to mechanical failure and those few that did make it over in time, despite being superior to every German tank of the period, only some 26 A12s were in France at the beginning of hostilities. It was argued later on that many were kept home to prevent an invasion. Alas, the truth is that they had gone and buggered up all their new tanks. It's also worth pointing out that as the nature of the war was still uncertain, Many of the Matildas sent to France had rear sleds fitted, like the tanks seen in World War I, as there was still a belief that the war could turn into a muddy trench scenario. Once this problem was identified, the reserve fleet of tanks based in the UK then began to have their suspensions lowered again, taking up more time and resources we simply did not have. This inability to communicate between departments culminated in the Arras counterattack, 
which was spearheaded when Matildas of both types were sent to stall the German advance, preventing the encirclement of the British Expeditionary Force. However, due to these blunders, there was also a woeful lack of A-12 tanks, having some 58 Mark Is and only 16 Mark II Matildas ready. And to add insult to injury, the light tanks which were sent to escort them were sent over with only 13 of them actually having their weapons fitted. The Matildas that did counterattack made good headway, and the German 37mm anti-tank guns couldn't touch them even at point-blank range, with many guns being simply crushed under their tracks. Even the vaunted German panzers sent to counter them were equally powerless, simply being swept aside as the tanks bravely drove on, trying to do as much as they could. This sent the German command into a bit of a panic, with reports of hundreds of tanks rampaging through their lines, which caused the German momentum to stop for a day. The Matildas themselves, however, began to run into problems, both mechanically and from increased air attacks. Those few that survived the gauntlet came under fire from 88mm anti-tank guns, which were ordered to directly fire at them. However, only two A-12s were knocked out in that engagement. But overall, the mission had failed, as while a corridor had been made, it was unable to reinforce and hold this position, and a decision was made to pull back. Despite near-total losses at the end, this gave the Allies at Dunkirk another 24 hours, which allowed the rest of the army to be evacuated, and so the UK remained an effective fighting force. The problems were finally resolved, and the Matildas would be fixed in time to be deployed to North Africa. Although many still had the faulty tracks, these were not as problematic in the hot arid conditions out there. The Matildas soon earned a reputation and were given the name Queen of the Desert, being well liked by their crews. Initially, these tanks fought against Italian tanks, which were utterly ineffective in any way to slow or even stop the Matildas, who could punch through them at a leisurely pace, and many Italian tanks simply abandoned their vehicles. However, the tables began to turn when they once again came up against Rommel, who brought bigger guns to a bar fight, and this time the Matildas' slow speed in the large open deserts found them very vulnerable to these guns, which were in large numbers and dug in positions not to mention the large minefields preventing the tanks getting close. To make matters worse, the high explosive rounds had still not been provided, and so only a direct hit to the gun's working parts would disable it. And the close support guns, which were supposed to support the Matildas, were armed primarily with smoke rounds only. Matilda losses began to mount with heavy casualties, particularly to German 88mm guns, which could penetrate them even at very long range, and eventually the Matildas were pulled out of frontline service, however they would serve elsewhere until the end of the war, but that's a tale for a different day. So on to varieties, and for the sake of brevity we'll discuss the UK adaptions here, as we can cover the Matildas abroad in another video. So we'll start with the A12 Mark I. This was the first production machine, coming in at 26.5 tonnes with a crew of four, and armed with a two pounder or 40mm gun, and a .303 Vickers coaxial machine gun, which is characterised by the distinctive cowl over the gun, powered by two AEC 95 horsepower engines and a Wilson epicyclic transmission with clutch and brake steering. Suspension consists of 11 small bogies protected by 25mm of skirting plate and characteristically has the older flat 14 inch wide stamp tracks and also distinctive vents over the stowage boxes on the front. These were later removed as they allowed rounds and fragments to enter which could set light to cleaning fluid stored there. These were the primary vehicles used in the outbreak of fighting in France in 1940. This was followed quickly by the Matilda 2A. This was an early change to the Matildas and British tanks in general and they switched out the Vickers 303 and they changed to the 7.92mm Beezer machine gun, which itself would go on to cause a few problems in British tank design. The cowl over the coaxial gun has been removed and a distincted fluted machine gun can now be seen on the left hand side. Then we have the Matilda 3, also recorded occasionally as 2A star. Visually this is the same as the Matilda 2, but now has two 96 horsepower Leyland diesel engines instead of the AEC engines in the back, and a notable sub-variant of this tank can be found in the Matilda 3 CS, or close support, which replaced the two-pounder gun with a three-inch howitzer. This was followed by the Matilda 4, which again had new engines, with the improved Leyland E170-171s, but otherwise was very similar to the Matilda 3. This too came with a close support version and a three-inch howitzer in place of the main gun if needed. And finally, there was the Matilda 5, 
This is the same as the Matilda 4, but with a few internal changes. Notably, it used a Westinghouse air servo mounted directly to the gearbox, instead of the Clayton air servo incorporated in control linkages found on the previous machines. There were, of course, other vehicles tested, primarily for engineering purposes, although, oddly enough, there doesn't appear to be a Matilda bridge layer. The Matilda Scorpions were used in North Africa to deal with the threat of mines. These Matildas were reworked in Egypt to have a mine flare added to them, and the name allegedly comes from the long arms protruding to the front, while the flail motor was on the left-hand side. The Scorpions came in what appears to be two flavours. Some are seen with the main guns intact, while others have them removed. Scorpion flails were also fitted to US Grant tanks as well. Another project which is not believed to have seen active service was the Matilda Baron. This came in three variants and was also a flail vehicle with a body built up around the actual Matilda chassis. And finally there was the Matilda CDL or Canal Defence Lights, which was a code name as it has nothing to do with canals or defence, but again we'll cover the CDL weapons in another video. Well guys, that's all the time we've got for Matilda today. We'll cover some of the more interesting other variants in a future video, and maybe those used by Australia and even uh, Russia. But if you did like this video, do give it a like and share, as we're hopefully trying to get this channel to grow. Um, you can also come and join us on Discord and talk all sorts of tank bollocks. Always welcome there. So, until next time, toodle pip. <laughs>